when you're going to run a statistical study, there are really three main pieces to doing that study. First, you've got to go ahead and get the data, collect the data. Second, once you have the data, you have to analyze it. And third, you have to present your conclusions. Of those three, getting the data, that first step, is the most crucial. If you don't have data that are collected well, then you are not going to get good results. So it's really important to understand how to collect data well. And that's what we want to talk about now. There are two types of studies generally that are done. The first is a survey, and the second is a causal study. In a survey, what we want to do is describe a population. For example, we want to learn what's the average income of doctors in the United States, or what's the difference in the GPAs of men versus the GPAs of women in your university. That's a survey, describe populations. In a causal study, what we actually want to do is figure out what's the effect of taking one action relative to taking a different action. For example, what's the effect of taking aspirin on curing my headache versus not taking aspirin? Or what's the effect of attending a job training program on, my, on, on a person's salary relative to not attending the job training program? Okay. That's causal studies. There are really two types of causal studies. There's randomized experiments and non-randomized experiments. We're going to talk about both of those as well. Let's start off talking about surveys. In a survey, there are really four main steps. The first step is you've got to establish that target population. What's the group that you really want to learn about? That's the target population. Second thing you need to do is make a list of all the people, all the units that are in that target population because you're going to actually take a sample of people from that list, and that's our third step. Lastly, once you've decided who you're going to pick, you actually have to go out and get the data. All four of those steps are really crucial. What we're going to focus on today is that third step, how you select a sample once you've got that list of your target population. And you have to be a little bit careful about how you do that. For example, you can't just go out uh, onto the street and, and get people and ask them questions. Let's think of an example. Let's say you wanted to survey people in your university, students in your university, about who they might vote for in an upcoming election. Well, you can't just arbitrarily pick people, right? Because you want to get people who are representative of everyone in your, in your university. You might think, well, that's pretty hard to do. I have to go out there and find roughly you know, the same percentage of men as, as there are in my university. I have to go out there and find the same percentage of Republicans and Democrats as there are in my university. I have to worry about socioeconomic status. right? I want just as many sort of high-income people uh, you know, students from high-income families as, as there are in the university. That could be really hard to do, to find those people. But it turns out that you can do it just by picking people at random. Okay? Just take that big list of the target population you have and throw darts at it. Okay? And wherever your darts hit, that's who you pick. Okay? It's amazing that that actually works. It turns out you can prove, you can show, that if you do that, you pick people totally at random, then that sample of people that you get should, in fact, be representative of your whole population. It should have characteristics that mimic the characteristics of your population. This is a pretty amazing thing, if you think about it. Just by randomly flipping coins, by throwing darts, you could get something that's representative. Okay? Uh, people didn't know this for the longest time. In fact, this is something that's only been known since the 1920s. Uh, before then, uh, people were trying to take samples by doing what I just said, by trying to figure out exactly who is representative. But it was revolutionized. This guy named Jersey Naiman figured out that if we take random samples, you can actually get representative results. And that revolutionized science. I think, I think you could argue it's the most important scientific advance in the 20th century, random sampling. Well, let's actually talk about how not to pick a sample, because we've learned how to pick a sample. Okay? There are lots of ways you can mess up if you don't pick random samples. Uh, one approach that's, that's often used by, 
uh, and it's not a good approach, is something called convenience sampling, where what you're trying to do is pick the units, pick the people who are most convenient. Okay? Let's take our example of surveying students in your university. You might go to uh, the student center, the university student center, and ask the people who come by you what they're, who they're going to vote for. That's convenient, right? But the people who are going to come to the student center may not be representative of the whole student body, right? Because those people, for example, maybe they're going to the student center because they're more active in university politics or they're more aware. Okay? So convenience sampling is a bad idea. Another bad idea is something called judgment sampling. And here the idea is you're going to go out there and you're going to use your judgment to try to pick who is representative, okay, who's a typical person uh, in, the, in, in the population. Okay? Judgment sampling is a bad idea because you've got inherent biases. And you might go and pick only those people who look like they're friendly and who will respond to you. Or people who you think, are, you know, subconsciously you might pick people who are like you in some way. Those people may not be representative of the whole population, and so you're not going to get good results. A third bad way to pick a sample is something called voluntary response sampling. Okay, you see this all the time in call-in polls, for example. People have to volunteer their responses. They have to, to call in or they have to uh, go to a website and fill in the survey. Okay? People who volunteer to respond to a survey, they tend to do that because they have strong feelings about that survey. Okay? They really want to answer the questions. If you have strong feelings, you're not likely to, to get the people who don't have strong feelings. Okay? And so, well, you're not going to have a representative sample. Okay? Voluntary response sampling is a bad method.